All right, as promised. An example problem on a bolted connection in shear and tension. If you remember, we're using an interaction equation between the shear capacity extracted and the tension capacity extracted. What we've decided to do for no reason other than it's as good as any, is we will first put our shear loads on here, check out bearing stresses, check out the uh, stress in the bolt in shear, make sure that the bolts are okay for shear. We'll probably hope that they're away from how much we could have in shear because we want something left over for tension. In an analysis problem, that's not a, not a problem because what it is is what it is. If this 54 kips is bigger than your bolts can handle in shear, you're off the charts anyway, so you've got to quit immediately. In a design situation, you've got to just pick a number of bolts where you leave some leftover capacity after you admit to the shear part and hope the tension that's left over is acceptable. And there are ways to get a handle on where to start. So the case is we have a W14 by 90 made out of A992 steel. We have bolted to it an A36 bracket, probably a T section. Got four bolts in it, subject to pulling the little plugs out of the uh, bracket are crushing the steel in the bracket, or perhaps doing the same thing in the wide flange. One thing's for sure, the wide, the T-section is a 10.5 by 31, it's given. You go look up the thickness of that item's flange, it's 0.615 inches, and it's bearing against a 58 KSI steel because it's A36. The W14 by 90 is out of A992 steel, and if you check its flange, which this connection is attached to, it's thicker, and the steel is stronger. So I don't have to worry about which one to check, whether I should check the uh, wide flange or if I ought to check the T section. The T section is guaranteed to control all bearing and uh, stuff like that. So to compute the nominal bearing strength, the flange and the T, I have two choices. I have 2.4 DTF sub ultimate, and I have that other thing, depending on the length of the plug in front. Uh, looks like he's not going to bother with that. And I say, you'd better go check those little plugs, make sure they don't pull out. He says, they won't pull out. I said, how do you know? He says, I'm going to design this thing, and when you tell me the little plug is going to pull out, I'm going to make the thing longer so it doesn't pull out. But he's uh, saying right off the front, assume that the crushing strength, which you can't do anything about it, it crushes when it's going to crush. You can always make the plug longer. You can always make the plug long enough so that it crushes first. And he says that right here. Assume all spacing and edge distance requirements are satisfied, including those necessary to use the maximum Nominal strength in bearing, which is crushing. So then you get 2.4, diameter of the bolt, thickness of the plate, times F sub U, and you get 74 kips per bolt. That's the crushing bearing. It's a bearing type failure. Plug shear is a bearing type failure. Crushing is a bearing type failure. Nominal supply available. We want all the words, that's all of them I know that relate to this guy right there. Now, to prove out these numbers that we're already starting to see, I'm just going to go ahead and throw in all the pages doing, having to do with bolts that you probably will refer to. First off, if you have a slip critical connection, we said that the nominal load was a coefficient of friction. Uh, D sub U, what was D sub U? What was D sub U? 1.13, what was it for? 
was because every time you tighten a bolt to the minimum required, you always about have to give me more. And they know you're going to give me more. And so they let you take into account what you're really going to put in there. 1.13 times the tension in the bolt, minimum required out of a table. Times a filler factor, which ours will always be 1, times the tension in the bolt, times the number of shearing planes. Now, this is only true if you go look at your little summary of uh, answers. If the bolt shears at 60 kips, and the bolt sh then the bolt will shear at 60 kips, and the bolt will shear at 60, and it'll shear at 60, and it'll shear at 60, and it'll shear at 60. And if the little plug pulls out at 80, and the little plug pulls out at 80, and the little plug pulls out at 40, well, then this is no longer true. I mean, it's true for any one bolt, but it's not true for all the bolts because something happened at this hole to not get the shear strength or the slip strength that we're talking about. Still has to be checked for bearing. Um, did we surprisingly get a resistance factor of 100%? Not be much variation found in a test. Filler factor was a 1 for us. If you also put tension on the connection, which we are just now doing, then the planes that you were planning on being compressed to this number on the previous page will not be available because you're going to pull them open a little bit. Then you must reduce this force in between here. And you reduce it by 1 minus. T sub U, D sub U, T sub B, N sub B. T sub U is the required. I don't like the word required. I guess it's okay. I mean, I like, I see it better if I say it's applied. The force is applied. And so, yes, that means it's required. But uh, that's like one step down the road to me. This is, you take this number right there. That's this number. N sub B is the number of bolts that you're putting in the connection. D sub U is the same. You reduce your slip capability by this amount. Bearing strength, 0.75 for resistance factor. You have a plug shear strength listed. You have a crush shear strength listed. You have other cases, too, which we don't get into. You get out, you'll probably want to read these things. Long slotted hole. Do you have any long slotted holes? Wow, saw one the other day. Maybe I better use this instead. Tables on the pretension in the bolts. Great group A, group B, bolt size, tension to be installed in the bolt. So back to our problem. The nominal shear strength of the bolts, we already have the nominal bearing strength now. Size of the bolt is that big, whether it's threaded or not. It's that big. If it is threaded, they'll knock your permitted shear stress down to account for the fact that you cut it at the threads. Your nominal capacity is uh, our nominal shear stress area of the bolt. Shear stress changed since I printed out all these beautiful pictures. So I had to change it to 54. And let's see where that 54 came from. Came right there. It was a group A bolt. Threads were not excluded from the shear plane. Nominal shear strength right off of here. You'll notice that nominal shear strength doesn't say it, but he means in the absence of tension. And he doesn't really talk about it on the tension stress here, but he means this is how much tension you can have in the absence of shear. You get them both on there, you can't have both those numbers. The area for threads cut, threads not cut, threads cut, threads not cut, same area. Pi D squared over 4 where D is the diameter of the shank. Those are designated A325. Shear plane includes the threads. Threads are excluded, included, excluded. So there's where the 54 came from.
There's the cross-sectional area of the shank. 32.5 kips per bolt is your shear nominal supply. Going back to what the picture looks like, we have a, I think we had a 60 kip load. No, we didn't. We had, we had a 60 kip load, but 15 of it was dead and 45 was live. 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live gives us 90 kips of load factored on the connection. Three fifths of it goes down because three fifths of its slope goes down. Three fifths of 90 is 54 kips of shear, and four fifths goes horizontal, so four fifths of 90 is a tension load. We're going to do shear first. It's arbitrary. We're going to start it with tension first and then worked over and see how much shear is left for us. But instead, we're going to do shearing stresses first. Then if there's something left over for us in tension, then we'll go see what uh, if the tension capacity is big enough left for us. Total shear or bearing load is three-fifths of 90. That's the 54 kips you see down. Shear bearing force per bolt, 54 over 4 bolts have been suggested. This is an ana analysis problem. 13.5 kips per bolt requested. The design bearing strength was, we had 74.91 off the previous page nominal. We're going to have to go ahead and put the fee in there to see what's permitted. This is the bearing permitted fee times uh, our nominal, 56.2 kips, well over what you need. The design shear strength of the bolts is the bolts were good for 32.5 kips per bolt, and they get a 0.75 fee on them, resistance factor, so they're good for 24. Out of the bearing and the shear, this one obviously controls but it's still above the request of 13.5 kips per bolt. 13.5 kips per bolt. So we're okay so far. Incidentally, the design shear strength is 24, and it's, uh, you're only asking for 13, so you've left me some, some room here in the shear. You haven't used up all the shear. If your numbers worked out and this said 24.4 is equal to 24.4 kips requested, then I'd say don't bother with any tension. Or Yeah, you can still put a little tension because you remember this curve. It actually could, you could still get tension, but uh, you shouldn't expect too much. This is the curve that we're using. It comes in at F sub nominal intention for the kind of boat you're using. In this case, it comes in at 90. Here is the nominal in shear, came in at 54. Let's see where those numbers came from. There was your 54. In the absence of tension, you get this much shear. In the absence of shear, you get 90 tension. So there's our two numbers. Then we draw a straight line instead of an ellipse, using the same method that the specs use. You can't go out here because you would exceed how much you can have just by shear alone. You can't go up here because you would exceed the maximum permitted, even if you just use a little shear. You can't go up there. So that'll have to be checked every time. So now we work on our tension side of the connection. Tension force was four-fifths of 90. That was your 72. Tension force per bolt is... Ask for 72 over 4 bolts. 18 kips per bolt is your request. That's T sub ultimate request. Determine how much remaining nominal available tensile stress for you after shear is accounted for. The AISC equation J33A says... The amount of tension stress nominal left for you, that's the little prime, is equal to 1.3 times the table value, the nominal tension full blast no shear, minus the uh, nominal tension full blast no shear, divided by phi times the nominal 
value, full blast for shear, times F sub R V. Pretty ugly there. Here's a better one, F sub R V. F sub R V is the actual shear stress that you put in the boat. And even if you use this equation, this equation will sometimes go nuts and go up in here. So you got to check that when you get how much you can have, he doesn't tell you more than 90. Less than full blast nominal tension with no shear. He tells you what all the terms are. F sub nominal tension, nominal tension stress. They also call it strength. I wish they wouldn't switch around like that. I wish they either call it stress or strength. The truth is it is a stress. In other words, you look at any of these things like uh, F sub NT. I don't, I don't see one offhand. We'll get one in a minute here. But they are actually KSI. And that is a strength. It's a strength in KSI. But I like I like this right here where he says stress. It is the tensile stress permitted in the absence of shear, 90. The nominal shear stress, including the fee, uh, in the absence of tension. Now, excuse me, not including the fee. That's nominal. So our F sub RV that we asked for, we took out of the connection already was the load over area. No fees, no this, no that. It's just an ultimate request divided by the area of the bolt. You have already used up 22.5 KSI of the shear capacity or the overall capacity of the connection. Now, I've got notes everywhere here. What do these notes say? This is the page number that you'll find this equation on. It's on page 16.1-25. It's on our 429D, back a few pages. It is uh, J33A is where you're going to get some of these numbers from. That's the table. I showed you my preferred version of this. I don't know. It just looks like less number work. F sub NT prime is equal to F sub NT taken out of both terms onto 1.3 minus your requested already removed capacity due to shear, divided by phi times FNV, the nominal shear permitted with no tension, right out of this table on this page. What is this stuff? These are for A325 bolts. They are table nominal strengths on page 16.1-120 and also on this page coming up in a minute. This is already used up. That's what that number means. F sub V, F sub, the symbology changed since last time. F sub R, V, and it's just flat old load over area. Your load, your V sub U, your V sub U over the area. Then we can solve for how much tension is left for you. 1.3 times the table value minus the tension table value divided by 0.75 is our fee times the table value for shear. Change since last time I taught this. Times how much did you actually already take out. I saw your hand in the cookie jar. There are fewer cookies in there now than there were before. How many cookies are left for me? Is equal to 67.1. Now, since that's less than the maximum number in the table, this is acceptable to proceed. Because you can still proceed, but if this number said 97.1, then you would say how much is left for me is 90. F sub NT is the nominal tensile stress left for you after accounting for the presence of shear, if it's okay to slip. Now, slip's a different thing. This one, he didn't mention that it couldn't slip. So, here were our tables. Continuing. The nominal tensile strength remaining for you was the 
permitted stress for you. See, he's using strength in two cases. You're using strength as if it were a stress sometimes, and it is a strength, and he's using it sometimes for a load. So the nominal tensile force, the reason I know it's a force, he has a stress times an area. The nominal tensile force remaining for you due to the tensile stress that's left for you is the 67.1 left for you times the cross-sectional area of the boat, and that's equal to 40.4 kips per boat. That's the nominal force in tension remaining for you per boat. So our only question is, how much did you ask versus how much is left for you? The, <coughs> the available, this is the nominal, the available will be 0.75 times that number. That's 30.3 kips per bolt. That's more than 18 kips per bolt is the tension load you asked for. That's so okay. <coughs> so the connection is adequate as a bearing type connection. He says, look, I haven't included prying on this thing. So not to obscure, it's just the prying thing adds one more complexity to it, obviously. <laughs> So you got enough complexity just in all of this stuff. He wants you to get that down. Now, the second thing was, the boss came in and says, is, now, that's slip critical, isn't it? I say, no, it's not slip critical. What do you mean is it slip critical? He says, well, it's supposed to say slip critical. I said, well, you look the specs right here. It doesn't say slip critical. He says, well, okay, go do it because I know it's slip critical. Now, okay, is it supposed to be slip, slip critical? No, not supposed to be slip critical. Had a 50-50 chance there. I have some sad news for you, though. <laughs> it is supposed to be slip critical. I mean, I just got balled out because it wasn't slip critical, and I did the whole thing. It's not slip critical. I didn't really lose any time because even if it's slip critical, it still has to be capable of a bearing-type connection. So, all right, I'll get right on it. He says, have it done before the morning. He says, it's already 9 o'clock at night. Yeah. From part A, the shear bearing and tensile strengths are satisfactory. From equation J3-4, and I know dang good and well that uh, Steinhope was going to ask me where that sucker came from. Uh, oh, here it is right here. It came uh, from page 16.1-126. And they should be here. I'll try and get them all there. I've got a copy on page 431F. So you don't have to dig out your manual. How much capacity you can have? Coefficient of friction, D sub U. I forget what's D sub U. One point one three. There you go. I don't even care if you know why, as long as you always know it's one point one three, because you get thirteen percent percent thirteen percent more tension in the bolts right across the board every time you tighten them up properly. Times the filler factor, times the tension in the bolt out of a table, times the uh, this should be, was this little n in the previous thing? I don't know whether we're using big n or little n, but that's the number of slip planes. Uh, here I say, do we still have 54 kips of slip capacity? I guess that's really what we're asking. Let's see if we still have 54. From table J31, prescribed tension. That's table 31, prescribed tension. Is that 3-1? From table 3, 1, the prime prescribed is 39 kips. Oh, that's not the tension, is it? This is, that's right, that's that pretension table. So you'd have to go to the pretension table and uh, find out what it says. He says 39 kips, i got to check on it. That's two of us that say that, that's a majority. So on this page right here, assuming class A surfaces, which you, surfaces, which you and I always do, we get a point three, which we always get. And for four bolts, you crank out all the numbers. Coefficient of friction, how much higher will you really put tension in the bolts? Uh, what kind of fillers do you have? Either none or one or six that are bolted down so they don't slip around. Times the tension of the bolts is 39 kips. One shear surface times four bolts, 52.9 kips. Then phi times that. I was going to say, hey, what happened? It's still the same. That's right. Our fee was a one for slip, wasn't it? There's so little variation in there that they say you do not need to 
have a 0 0.9, a 0.75, 100%. Now then, he says, but there are some tensile loads on there. I say, well, yeah, you know, no big deal. He says, I think it is a big deal. You are opening up that compressed pair of plates. Uh, yeah, you're right. He says, do you know how much you must reduce your capacity, 52.9? I say, I think it's in the book. He says, go dig it out. One minus the requested load of 72 kips, applied tension load, reduces the pressure between the T and the flange, divided by 1.13 times 39 kips per bolt times four bolts. Basically, you put this number into the bolts when you started. Now all you're doing is you're taking it back out. Therefore, you only get about 60% of the slip capacity you had before, or you were planning on. Therefore, K sub SC, parentheses 59, 2.9. Okay, okay, he's saying multiply the, multiply the value you get for K sub SC times the 52.9 without accounting for the fact that you opened up the plates. It gives you 31.3. Darn, that's sad, isn't it? Didn't work. You were asking for 52 kips of shear load request capacity. You only got 31.3. Go back and really make sure he's not just kidding us. No, we really did. We asked for 54. So how are we going to fix that? How? Bigger bolts. Bigger bolts would work. I was thinking more bolts. I don't know why bigger bolts would work. Of course, bigger bolts will also cause uh, wider holes in things, stuff like that. But to the, more bolts is a problem also. But we do got to do something. There's no choice. Now, let's just say that instead of using four bolts to try and get this thing up so the, there's more pressure between the plates, I do that with more bolts, then when you put the 72 kips of tension on there, it comes down, it doesn't reduce it so badly that I don't get my 54 capacity. I had a reason for going there, but I don't remember what it was. Uh, sure. Maybe I'll think of it in a minute. I was going to use more bolts. Oh, I know what it was. After I use six bolts in there, then I got to go back and do all of this bearing stuff and shear stuff, and it's right. No, why not? It worked in the first place. It worked with just four bolts in bearing. So if you've got to add two more bolts to make it work in slip, you don't have to go back and check it with the f six bolts in bearing. You know it'll work then. And so, in effect, you're through. <coughs> See, it was a good question. I just couldn't remember what it was. All right. Now then, we're going to design... Let me see what this tail end. Where did we find out the bad news? Here's where we found out the bad news. No, that one was okay. This was in tension. This was in tension. This was in tension. This was in tension. Oh, this was slip critical. Here we go. And we found out it wasn't going to work as a slip critical connection. And he lets it go with that. Somebody has to go back in and stick some more bolts in there. Now then, the specs on tension... High strength bolts in slip critical. There's our equation. It's on page 16.1-126. Coefficient of friction. Uh, for fillers, seems like we already had these pages. And how much our slip critical thing gets reduced? Yes, yeah, says already covered. Okay. These are the pages out of your book, but they don't have pretty pictures on them. You do have an error in your book. Uh, this should be 52.88 kips. Oh, here it is right here. So it's a pretty easy f problem to see. Because one times the old number isn't this. Loud stress, loud stress, loud stress. All right. Now then. Design. A consi 
concentrically loaded connection. They call that a simple connection. It is a connection like the one you and I just did where the load runs through the centroid of the connection, through the centroid of the group of bolts. Subjected to a service load of 50 shear, 100 kips in tension, the loads are 25 dead, 75 live percent. Fasteners are in single shear. Bearing strength will be controlled by a 5 16 inch thick part made out of A36 steel. Uh, assume all spacing edge distances are okay, including the maximum edge distances. Uh, you can have full crushing strength. We're going to make the little plugs long enough so they don't control. Determine the required number of three-quarter inch group A bolts for the following cases. Bearing type connection, I know how to do that. With threads in the plane of shear, no problem. Slip critical connection with the threads in the plane of shear as before. Nope. In the plane of shear, yeah. All contact surfaces, clean mill scale. Means coefficient of friction, 0.3. It says considered to be a preliminary design, so you don't have to include the prying action. Here's our old friend. This is your nominal strength. Comes from these pages and these uh, our pages. Got to top out at 90. Going to design so that we start out at 54 and see what we got left. If you're designed, or if you ever try and pick a number bigger than 54, you can't even get started. Here's your loading on this particular boat. It's 150 kips of tension, 75 kips of shear. Factor loads, 25% uh, of the load he gave us was dead. That's 1.2 dead. 25%, uh, 75% 75 of it was live. And so 1.6 times 75% of this to get our factor load in shear and intention. So here we go for bearing type connection, threads in the plane. He says, assume that tension controls. Well, I'm not used to you assuming tension controls. And he says, yeah, well, you're not you, uh, used to designing things either. He says, if you'll tell me, if you'll guess the number of bolts like you did in the previous problem, then I can start and I'll find out how much shear is really in the bolts, and then I'll tell you how much is left for you in tension. But this is a design problem where the number of bolts is unknown. I said, you just said they were three-quarter inch bolts. He says, the number, listen, listen, the number is unknown. Ah, okay. Okay, so he says, assume tension controls. Truth of the matter is, when you get a little further in here, you find out he's assuming tension and shear control at the same time. Well, I don't think that's real likely. He says, probably not. I said, okay, um, I'm going to try and sell this to some people, some students. He said, tell them it's a starting point. They don't have to use it. If they'd rather, they can just guess 16 bolts. We don't care. And if it's good, they'll, you know, then knock it down to 10. Or if it's not good, they'll build it up to 20. And in about a week, they'll be through. I said, okay, your way is sounding better all the time. He says, you decided that F sub N T uh, nominal tension left for you in tension is 1.3 F sub NT, that's equation J33A, minus uh, table value net tension, nominal tension, table value permitted maximum nominal shear in the absence of tension times V times the true shear request, and but of course less than that. I say, he says, okay, now let's go ahead and put in our uh, numbers for this bolt. Okay. Uh, F sub NT was 90. That was this guy up at the top. Go ahead and put in uh, the 54 at the same time. Uh, there's the 90, there's the 54, there's the 0.75, and B less than 90. This works out 117 minus 2.22 times F sub NV calculator number right here, but it's got to be less than 90. Okay? He says F sub NV times all these numbers, so I can go ahead and get allowed numbers here, is 0.75 across the board. So he multiplies 0.75 times this number in a parentheses, less than 0.75 of that, and he goes ahead and cranks out the numbers. He says, this is how much permitted, not nominal, 
This is now how much permitted stress you can have in tension for your case. 87.75 minus 1.667 times F sub N, but it got to be less than that. Then here he comes in here, and here's where he really says, why don't we just assume that this number is 150, the request, divided by the area of the volts. I say, okay, in other words, you're assuming that the tension really controlled. Well, he says, kind of, because at the same time, why don't we just go ahead and assume that the bolts in shear also failed with your load divided by some of the bolts. Or not necessarily failed, but that is... You set your requested stress equal to the tension uh, available, and you set your requested equal to what's permitted for you in the shear in this equation. I say, okay. He says, look, it's a place to start. Nobody says it's going to be perfect. Half the time you won't have enough bolts. Half the time you'll have too many bolts. But it's the one thing's for sure, at least it gives you a point we found it's good to start. All right. So he's going to take 150 over some of the area of the bolts. That's the true shear stress in the in the bolt. And he's going to put that right here. Is equal to 87.75 minus 1.1767 times the true shear stress in the bolts. The load was 75 kips divided by the area of the bolts. I say, I see one nice thing. Uh, however you got it, that equation only has one unknown. He says, do you notice what it is? Uh, it's the area of the bolts. He says, isn't that nifty? I say, well, let's see how it works out. Therefore, you solve for multiply everything through here by uh, the sum of all the area of the bolts, and it only appears here. And you solve for that. You need 3.134 square inches of steel in the bolts. Since the area of one bolt is pi d squared over 4, then I can tell you that you need, there was that minimum bolt pretension table, and I can tell you that you need, uh, here's your, how much shear stress we put in those uh, permitted numbers. You need, here's the tension strength 0.75, here's that equation again. Must have thought I lost those pages. Oh, come on, here we go. And therefore, the number of bolts required is, you need that much total, you get that much per bolt, you need eight bolts. Even if it was 6.8, you wouldn't use seven bolts. You know, you're going to use them in pairs, probably. Maybe, it's first trial. So we're going to try eight bolts. First, we check the upper limit on F sub NT prime. The upper limit is just meaning, does the case we're trying here exceed the 90 KSI to begin with, or whatever it is when it's factored? The actual loads give the actual shear stress requested. They have to be less than permitted. F sub N, F per bolt shear is actually 75 over our new area of the bolts, number of bolts, you're going to be putting 22.22 KSI in my bolts. It has to be less than the table value with a fee on it. So he hasn't really done it here. He just says, I don't know what he's going to do with it later, but me, I can't resist. If I'm going to have that much shear stress in the bolts, really, I'd like to know how that compares with how much I have available. 40.5 KSI. So I'm okay on shear. Not only that, there's some leftover, which I can probably use on the tension side of the equation. Check the tensile left for you. This is the stress, nominal tension, not yet factored for you. 1.17 minus, uh, I don't know if this is still in your book or not. It's just a mistake. Minus, it's in fact, it used to be 2.5 when I was younger. Minus 2.222 times F sub requested in shear, 21.22. There's your request. There's your request. There's your request. Is equal to 69.8. And you have now proven to me that you are not going above 
the max permitted. Now, one thing he's got, he just flat forgot. <clears throat> he forgot to check tension and stress in the bolts. Okay, down here, he got back on. See, this is tension left for you nominal. This just says you didn't go above 60. This doesn't say this number will work in your bolt. And he accidentally got back on shear, and I think he just forgot to do that. So now he's going to check the shear in the bolts. I'm not sure. Oh, I know why he rechecked it, because I'm the one who checked it up here. Had you checked it right here, you wouldn't need to recheck it here. Here I checked stresses to make sure the stresses were okay. Down here, all he does is multiply times the area of the bolt, how many bolts there are, and prove that the loads are okay. Well, if the stresses are okay, the loads have to be okay. So here's his check. Uh, phi times F sub N V permitted times area bolt times number of bolts in shear that was three quarters is phi 54 was shear 44 18 was the area of the bolt there's eight of them you have a 143 capacity that's bigger than 75 kips request that's that's definitely uh, going to be the case you'll notice that the numbers even look like they're about in the same proportion they ought to be then he says i'm going to check the crushing when he says check bearing he's checking the crushing so he goes to the plate crushing thing, and he checks 2.4, diameter of the bolt, thickness of the plate, F sub U, eight bolts bearing against the plate, 196, greater than that. 75 kip shear load, not the 150 tension. Uh, I guess that's because on a lot of exams, I run across people that check that against the tension load. It's only the shear load. The uh, tension load causes no bearing. Only the shear load causes bearing. And a problem. He forgot to check the tension. So here's the check for tension. Has not yet and must still check tensile stress to make sure the actual tensile stress is smaller than how much we left on the table for you. Here's your actual request, load over area, uh, stress requested in tension. 150 kips of tension divided by 8 bolts, area of the bolts, 42.44, and we left 69.8 on the table for you, so now I'm happy. It's good. But had this number right here come out 70.6, still less than 90, 70.6 is not smaller than what was left for you, and the connection would not be good. Now you can do the same thing we did on the previous page. You can also check the loads, but it's not required. If the stresses are okay, the loads have to be okay. So R sub UT, less than phi R sub nominal. That's phi, F prime, A, B, N, B, blah, 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 185 kips. You only asked me 150 Good enough. And I have no idea. Oh, I see. Well, 75 kips was our shear load, so that does look like our T. And evidently, this is where we were trying to say, how are you going to make sure that the plugs don't pull out? You know, here's how I make sure the plugs don't pull out. There you go. Those plugs not going to pull out. If it's an angle, of course, looks like this, and if it's an angle, it would be subject to what? Very good. Block shear. Okay. We don't cover any of that. All right. A brief introduction to welded connections. Bolted connections are nice, but they, how many minutes I got left? Five? I, don't, I saw you checking. <laughs> Bolted connections are nice, but they do put holes in your plate. You're right, five. <laughs> Welding is, uh, but the nice thing about bolts is they can be done by unskilled people. You give a guy a drill or a lady a drill, you know, and they can usually drill a reasonable hole in something and put it in the pretty much the right place. A lot of that's done by machines anyway. 
and then they can put it together pretty well because they'll have an impact wrench and it'll turn off with the right torque or the uh, juice will squirt out from underneath the washer or the torque wrench will go something like that until it's time to quit. Uh, the, the putting the holes in the plates is the biggest problem. Welding, the biggest problem is you got to have somebody who knows their business. You can really cause a lot of grief. I was on a case, actually, in Beaumont. The name of the place was Lee Engineering. Terrible. And the welder told us that uh, he'd put a weld on there, and then he would put a kind of a thing, and called it a cap. And it was called a surface something. Well, the people came by and they thought that the weld was that big. But if he only put this much weld in there and then, you know, kind of covered it up, it looked like it was the right size, but it's not. And it had a collapse. So you've got somebody who's not careful, doesn't care, really wants to get home, not certified. They can mess you up pretty good. They don't, oh, no, too expensive. Wow, cost of fortune. This is an offshore drilling rig. We just bring it in the lab, right? We have to cut it up to get it in the lab and x-ray it. Then we have to weld it back together and we have to bring it back in to x-ray the welds. You know, can if, can if it's necessary, but generally speaking, no. We depend on uh, certification. The way it works, you this guy's got a plus charge this guy's got a minus charge you get it close enough an arc jumps across there it melts off metal off of the electrode there's stuff on the outside of it <coughs> when it uh, blows off because of the heat it's a gas the gas keeps the metal from uh, getting oxygen on it till it gets cool and it just makes one part of, out of the whole thing <coughs> excuse me one way you can do them, they're called fillet wells. They look kind of like this. They're not permitted to really do this. Uh, one thing you also won't let them do is you won't let them burn the corner off on a reasonably thick plate because then you don't know if this is the size of the weld or this is the size of the weld. <coughs> <coughs> Read that material. There's groove wells. There's complete penetration wells. There's plug wells where you weld in the plug. The strength of the weld depends on the strength of the blade. <coughs> and it also depends on the strength of the electrode, the metal. They make you use a matching well, uh, weld material, a, weld, a rod that matches well to the plate. Their basic strength is force times area. What else is new? Here's, your th here's the size of the weld, whether it looks like that or not, you don't normally count it. The root is down in here. Come on in. Come on in. It's okay. Oh, if it's, uh, people avoid my class no matter what, even if they don't know me. Yeah, dang. And the strength of that weld right there will be based on its throat dimension. That'll be W times the cosine of 45 degrees and how long it is. And when you pull on this weld side and when you pull on that side, you get that much strength. It's kind of interesting if you have the weld and you pull up on this plate and you pull down on this plate, you get the same strength. Well, not maybe, not really, but kind of looks that way. There are, there are corrections to that. See you next time.